Good afternoon. I've sent to the organizers three options of presentations. They have chosen this topic. The network-based, network-bound disk encryption. So if you don't hear the other two presentations, that's not my fault, but the organizers. Rejoice. This topic is not uh, very well explained so far, and uh, these are quite pioneer developments. So let's begin. This presentation is about a group of projects, there's more than one, uh, that were created by my colleague Nathaniel McCullen from the Red Hat. He couldn't make it here, and uh, I'm located closer, so I will make his presentation. It's on network-bound disk encryption. Uh, it's not about uh, that only. The typical situation is when everything failed in the data center, you need to load everything and to restore the machines, but they're all encrypted. And after the loading, they request the password. So you're running between either um, hardware or virtual consoles, and you enter those passwords, lots, lots of them. Uh, this is, uh, happens. Uh, in many data center, they have blackouts, and you need to restore those machines. See, many more machines to be restored. And uh, this is a nightmare um, that people see on their laptops if they encrypt disks after uh, the machine is switched off and uh, loaded this password has to be re-entered um, quite a typical case earlier we dealt with standards and we've tried to determine what will we encrypt how it's um, assessed uh, from the point of view of the branch uh, things, but um, in 20 years we've kind of standardized uh, the encryption algorithms, we've developed uh, rather clear uh, things uh, regarding the uh, quality of cryptography. Now we're dealing with automation of everything, everything, installation, um, deployment, uh, redeployment uh, um, of the things. That's an important topic. That's what happens today, but when everything is done and we can, we can deploy in uh, the solutions uh, in an automatic mode, the next uh, uh, task for tomorrow is development of policies. Those who do the automatic deployment uh, should somehow determine things. So if we get back and take a look at the loading. If we have encrypted volumes, the password to them should be known by somebody who um, um, starts um, uh, these uh, launches, these uh, machines, and uh, uh, it should be prescribed how the access to the password is given to a man or a machine. And all this um, automation, if now it's binary, including policies, they're binary as well. The policies of tomorrow won't be binary, most likely. Most likely, uh, there'll be a transition from one condition to the other. It's quite possible that um, this one should be given only if he has come in the company of that one. But if he came alone, he shouldn't be given it. So all these policies, which are used uh, for certain standard encrypted things. Uh, actually, if we understand how it's all made, how do we automate them? Um, typically, it looks like this. We have a certain key that we use for encryption. We usually don't use it directly. We use a certain symmetric key with which we encrypt our source one, initial one, uh, so that we could um, uh, change those external keys. Yet around them, we make one more encryption key, encryption of encryption, key encryption key. So we have a packet of, um, say, 
envelopes, and the very, very key, the very important key is in the center, in the middle. So there's a certain phrase that you have to know, and it automatically enables you to decrypt everything else. If we uh, provide this phrase to three or four people, all the three or four become the target of, say, evil willed criminals who want to get to our secret key. As a rule, instead of that, um, stronger key is used from the point of view of uh, cryptography. It's random, and then it's uh, placed somehow uh, in uh, some escrow system which stores our keys. Um, uh, the access to the escrow system should also be protected somehow. For example, uh, some TLS may be used to or uh, GSS API. So this channel should be encrypted as well. And uh, our escrow should trust and check the one who uh, applies to him with his um, uh, certificate. And that applicant uh, should uh, um, check the escrow who stores the key. So finally, we get the following. This trust this should be the verifying center, or it has to be the center of key distribution, KDC. So in fact, to store that yellow secret, the source initial key, this forms the infrastructure. Whether we like it or not, it's necessary. Otherwise, leakages are possible at different stages. Yeah, all this needs to be backed up as well. And in fact, we have to back up the whole process each step. So everything becomes very brittle and fragile. So now let's see. There was a heart bleed that proved that all this is unnecessary. If we have all this and it's done correctly, Still, one of the servers that generated an incorrect certificate at installation of TLS connection may be broken. It, it may be broken, broken from outside, and all this becomes useless. Considering that we presuming TLS uh, is available, certificates and an agreement. Uh, that enables to protect the key transfer, you know, up to the heart bleed. It's impossible. There's no absolute guarantee. The level of complication of all this uh, just give, makes the attack surface bigger. If we have at least three or four or five points of data transfer, then the attack surface is getting larger, that many fold. And those escrow mechanisms, the storage of those keys, they're difficult to implement. And the most interesting point is that the mechanism of public keys, X509, is difficult to use it, not only from the point of view of the administrator. Quite often there were leakages. A couple of weeks ago it happened that a person erroneously published the private key instead of the public key in a big, big company. Well, it was an administrator with uh, great experience. I think he loaded it uh, in Twitter. He published it in Twitter. That's one point um, of the issue. The other point is that the developers uh, uh, find it difficult to understand the X509 model, and quite often they uh, use the code, which is easy to break. Um, X509 is using other components within. For example, all the certificates have a certain structure at storage and uh, uh, transfer via the net, um, like SN1, uh, which is used for presentation of this data is known for uh, the fact that it can't be realized without errors. If you have realization without errors, it means you haven't been found yet. In fact, we need to regard something 
different. For example, asymmetric encryption. If uh, we regard our situation, this one, what do we do? In fact, uh, no additional infrastructure is actually necessary. We simply need to somehow subdivide into three parts uh, uh, the usage and the storage of the key. There's the key which is stored in many envelopes. And there's someone who says that this key may be decrypted. And it says how to do it, with the help of what? If in this we start, we get to the initial stage, we need to use mathematics. Don't be scared. Everything simple is erroneous. Everything uh, comprehensive uh, is uh, not usable, but Diffie Hellman is going to scare us now. What you see is the standard um, key exchange, Diffie Hellman, which is used in TLS. Uh, the first step at uh, the uh, agreement of the client and the server between themselves. The client has a uh, own set of keys, uh, private and uh, public key. The server has uh, own uh, private and public keys, both are interrelated. They know about each other, that uh, they choose a certain big, simple number, which is primitive according to a certain model. This number and P model are known to everyone, in particular to these two, perhaps to someone else as well, the ones who are bugging. But the private key is known uh, to each own party, and uh, the other keys are not exchanged. Uh, that's the standard Diffie-Hellman algorithm. It works for RSA, for elliptic curves, um, nothing difficult. Quite often, uh, this is visualized in such a way. We have two correspondence, they have common yellow color, that's the G number and P module that you're using, and they have their private keys, uh, those colors which are red and turquoise. They exchange between themselves with the public part of these uh, colors. Thinking that uh, the division of this mix, public and common, is mathematically expensive for execution. At least so far, this is so. They've exchanged their colors, mixed, and uh, with secret colors, and uh, received a common secret K, which is restored on both sides, in both bodies. That's the scheme used in TLS. Uh, that's the standard first step of TLS, restoration of the key that may be used. Um, uh, take a look at this um, in a different way. Now look to the left of the slide. Provisioning. Same thing is described as before, but uh, the steps uh, are interchanged. First, the server generates own private key and the public key connected with the private key. It gives away the public key somewhere and the client, say, gets it not in online but in offline before it does the Diffie-Hellman. The customer also, uh, the client also generates a private and secret key, calculates that common color, the bottom, K, by multiplying own key and that known G number and gets a correct result. Next, unlike the Diffie-Hellman, the customer uh, throws away the calculated common secret after using it and uh, throws away own private key. What he's left with is the public uh, key of the server and of himself. Next part was that was provisioning. We've determined uh, what the 
client knows before he begins to use uh, this. Um, second part, the client gives his public key to the server. The server uses this public key, um, then calculates uh, that common color at the bottom and returns it. Thus, the client can restore the common key. Uh, the problem with this scheme is that uh, it's absolutely unsafe, insecure. That common key K is uh, uh, transferred uh, via the network openly, and any attacker may get it. Also, the client uh, passes the public key to the server, so the passive attacker may also get this common secret, uh, uh, having calculated this like the server does. The server gets the public key and thus also knows the common key. Hence, the server may impersonalize the client. So, in fact, for this scheme to work, we need our public client key to be private. The client should have the private key plus the public key that nobody sees. Then how can he um, communicate with the server? Well, the ser he can communicate with the server using quite an interesting thing. It's a simple modification of Diffie-Hellman, done uh, by Nathaniel McCallan and Bob Rary from Red Hat. It's as follows. We still do the provisioning. The server calculates its public-private key, gives away the public key. The client takes this public key, calculates the common secret, throws away the common secret and the private key. What is left with him is own public key and server public key. This step, uh, this is the provisioning step before we use something. We've just calculated and stored something. And when we need to restore our secret key, all these values, what does the client do? Instead of sending, like here, his public key, he calculates a couple of keys more randomly. This, um, they're called ephemeric keys because they only exist at the time of that single applica um, um, application. Then uh, the client calculates everything like in a standard scheme uh, method of Diffie-Hellman. It's uh, using it, this ephemeric public key and then adds it to his public key. Since uh, this operation may be done reverse, in a reverse way, he transfers the added key. The server does the calculation of uh, the uh, um, any random received key. So there's the color of a different color if it was uh, transferred incorrectly, or it's, it's correct if it was done correctly. And then the initial value is returned. Then the client deducts from that calculated value the uh, result of multiplication of uh, the server public key and uh, the private uh, key. And since this is reversible, he gets the um, value he needs. For this uh, to work, neither the uh, private nor the public ephemeric uh, keys should leave the machines. They, don't, they shouldn't get to, to the uh, network, um, only the calculations. For uh, the client's public key to remain private, the ephemeric keys should be private, disregarding the fact that we are calculating a couple of private ones. Um, so the scheme becomes simpler, like this. We have a secret encrypted. We do that exchange of Macalamrary with the server. The server does the calculation and returns own half of what was calculated, like in Diffie-Hellman. But the key which is transferred has a special sense uh, for the client. It has no sense for the server at all. All this works very quickly. No storage is necessary by the server. If the server private key is uh, placed into some cryptography equipment like HSM hardware, 
the one who may get in and uh, break our server won't be able to do anything. Uh, he'll use the condition of the server uh, at the moment until it's found, but he can't take the private key somewhere else and he can't use it. Having gasped uh, the connection in the network, he won't be able to do it. So this scheme, this method is much more interesting and attractive uh, in comparison with the traditional escrow. So the server presence during provisioning is not necessary. All we need from the server in this uh, method is its public uh, key. See here, the server side gives the public key. The client may get it offline or online anyway. The server presence is necessary during the restoration. That's the sense of the restoration. We get connected to the presence of a certain object, and not at us, but at uh, the side of uh, uh, the knowledge of uh, keys is not necessary from the server. Server has no information besides the param parameters of communication channel. That's all. IP address of the client. That's all. He doesn't know anything else about it, about him. What he received, what he was sent, is a certain public key that has something has to be done to it, the operation. And it's mixed with the ephemeric um, uh, key, which is random. So it's also a random thing. It cannot uh, help in, in identifying the client. There's no transfer of keys. The server doesn't know the private key of the client. The server doesn't transfer any info. The passive observer or the attacker cannot do anything about it. Authentication of uh, the client is not necessary at all. Everything done by the server is difficult, etc. In fact, difficult, uh, and that's it. Then you drop it. Uh, the um, encryption of uh, uh, the encryption of the transport is not necessary, and the encryption of all this consequence, uh, if we get back here, of all these uh, um, data transfers isn't uh, necessary um, at all. So it seems ideal. This model works with uh, traditional crypto elliptic curves. It also works with other algorithms like GOST, where the ephemeric pair of keys is part of a normal exchange. So the model uh, uh, reminds of uh, the GOST internal structure. In theory, um, well, it's a um, uh, number of um, open source projects. One of them is TANG. It's a simple HTTP server that exchanges data in JSON format, uh, JSON web encryption to be more precise. Um, it's a pretty fast and on a usual uh, laptop, it processes around 2,000 operations per second. On a normal server, it's uh, um, dozens, uh, hundreds of thousands of operations per second. Um, when in the morning, everybody comes to work and should log in at the same time, that's the ideal storm, classical one. So this uh, um, is uh, simplified by this method. It's one or two seconds, not minutes, not hours. Um, the code is um, rather small. It uh, may be read in one evening. And uh, yeah, you see what's happening there. The audit of this uh, code is rather uh, simple. Dependencies are not big. It's available in Fedora 26, RM74. I hope Deben will finish what he started, uh, the attempt to integrate uh, the whole code. And it will be available in DFM as well. Its installation is rather simple. At Fedora, for example, we install the tank uh, package and uh, we launch the tank D. In Fedora, the tank is built in a way that it's um, um, integrated with the support of activation of sockets, s and doesn't do anything in the network. s and is doing this work. And the activation of the socket uh, 
uh, does the following. The app application to the transport automatically launches the TNG and then it um, processes the entrance. On the client size side, uh, the client part is used. It's called Clevis. It's a project uh, which sends the key mixed with ephemeric key does a little bit more. There's automation of um, decryption and uh, policy management. Um, again, small dependencies integrated on the level of uh, the early um, loading into there and other. It's integrated uh, with a GNOME and uh, it enables, for example, you insert the memory stick and it will be decrypted automatically if you have a server to which uh, this memory stick is um, connected. Actually, all this is available starting from Fedora, uh, starting from Fedora 24. L74, Debian, uh, they are somehow slow with it. Um, that's the way it looks like. Um, say we've installed our client clavels, uh, clavis, and it's using different modes. Uh, for example, the mode of work with Tang, in fact, uh, enables us to encrypt uh, certain data. In our case, uh, if you look at, uh, may I lead something? Okay. I was lucky. The word echo is uh, in red color anyway. Two symbols, PT, I'm trying to um, Encrypt them. Having transferred it to Clevis, Clevis um, applies to Tang on that address, uh, asks us um, whether we want to use this uh, server. It is um, assigned with this key. Well, not the key in this case, but the signature of the key. Do we trust it? Yes. Um, uh, the received result is a kind of a JSON object. Um, which is presented. Well, uh, you see the beginning, the ciphertext, a certain uh, value to decipher. It's enough um, that this file, this JSON object, is given to Clevis with the decrypt command. That's it. Automatically, it'll apply to the server uh, mentioned in this JSON file and do the calculation. It will provide our initial secret information recorded, these two symbols. Uh, if I stop the tank server, uh, then you, I won't be able to decrypt anything, since our server isn't uh, accessible, so we won't be able to calculate anything. So it also supports escrow. Not only its own server, if we have a kind of escrow in the form of HTTPS server, which receives comments for the standard protocol, then we can request, make a request, we can ask it to save our key on the side of the server and to give us this wrapping, it will encrypt it in the same way. Well, that's fine, but it's much more interesting when all this is used for something more important. Well, we have a kind of disk. In this case, the VSDA1. It is encrypted using a standard for Linux Lux container. We can connect it and to put the information, this J JSON file, JSON object, which it's located now in encrypted block using this utility. And uh, we can see that it is put in the second slot. We start counting from zero. So in the second slot, in slot one, we have our data, prone time in looks, only direct data storage was possible for about two, three years ago. Abstract object support was added. JSON was uh, chosen because as of today it's quite user friendly and uh, convenient format of storing anything. So it can be generated, uh, folded up, and uh, put into the look slot.
interdegenerate in Fedora, it's draw card. It's a board that can read this meta information from looks and it can feed it to Clevis when interde is launched. To unlock the external connected disks, there is integration with uh, disk two. Now let's look how it works. Well, I have a virtual machine, which has a certain disk, Kukau, standard Kukau, Fedora 27 beta is installed from Friday or Thursday. If I launch this system, we'll see a standard invitation to write password to decipher the encrypted disk. So I have to write my password, but we have everything integrated with Clavis. There, my laptop it is launched beyond this virtual machine, so I downloaded it and I can enter the system. I hope I will enter. Well, here, let's take a terminal and let us look at the contents of the disk. This structure, I just reformatted it, unpacked it from B64 and reformatted it so that it's readable. So this is a JSON structure, which is used by Clavis to store information here with C standard keys, key descriptions, which connected with server, related to a server curves, elliptic curves, in this case, uh, 521, and algorithm of verification of uh, the secondary key and the oral of the server. So we unpacked everything. Now we can use it, it works fine. If we switch up the system and in parallel, I will switch up tank. Then when I switch it on next time, you will see that the system will wait limitlessly for the introduction of the key. So the server is inaccessible, so the only way is to insert password from the keyboard. I go back to the slide. If we look at Clavis, we'll see that it's not decryption only. Here we're working with the policy. Now, a bit of mathematics. I will try to be brief. So here we can indicate several sources, a group of sources. Here we use the mechanism of key exchange of Shamir. In 1979, Shamir developed method 
of uh, dividing keys into parts and bringing them back together on the interpolation Lagrange methods. Maybe you remember geometry. We can restore a curve uh, if you have two points parable, have three points, and so on. So we have a certain number of points. We can interpolate and uh, obtain other points. Shamir thought that we can use this mechanism not on surface only, but on a kind of sub-multitude of numbers, and we can restore it, dividing it by some into some parts. So this is a classical scheme. It's widely used. It's convenient. It does not require any semantic connection uh, to the operations. So if our key is divided into a certain number of parts and m is less than n, it will be enough for us to restore the secret key, the contents of this key is not important in this case, and we can combine these keys, schemes at all levels. We can add other categories. So this is a simple laptop. We have a user and have admin. If not fired, the user can work in the system. We can add them an automatically unlockable laptop when the user can use password beyond the corporate network and when he comes to work his uh, corporate um, network will be unlocked because uh, the laptop will see this server or we can say we need two secrets for example, two different user passwords uh, to enter the system. It can be not a laptop, but can be a server. So more privileged access. So here we see implementation of organizational policies. So we can combine them. For example, QR code is put into the safe and in TPM key is generated inside the laptop in this cryptographic uh, unit and four other units can be used tank server bluetooth so if you I remove disk from chassis TPM is absent so I will not be able to put it into another laptop, another chassis, and uh, decrypt it. But if I have this disk in my machine, I need two other elements to restore access. These are password and smart talking, or password and server tank, or if I, I'm at my working place and I have some Bluetooth talking with a small range, I can use it. If I go to a cafe, I can use password. If I come home, I can use my password only. If I'm at the office, I do not have to unlock anything. So, in Clevis, this scheme allows me to use two different tank servers or even more sophisticated mechanisms now. A couple of words about projects. There is a Jose or Jose project. This is an implementation of subscription and encryption in the J JSON format. This is an implementation of the algorithms described in RFC, quite widely used in web programming. Another project is Luxmeta. It's a small project which allows to store information inside the container logs. And uh, now about the future, what shall we talk about? So there functionality support, small talking support and other cryptographic primitives in Clevis 
that will be support for non root volumes, TPM V2, which is very much different from TPM1. TPM2 is not completed in hardware form, but it's in the pipeline, password pin, smart talking, encryption E14, support and so on in Tang on the service side. We would like to see two aspects. We would like to learn how to call off keys given to clients. For this, we have to somehow recognize, identify client. For this, we need client ID. But anyway, we don't have to back up anything to store anything. Everything will be saved. The code is quite simple. We invite you to contribute with your algorithms. So as for the names of the projects, they come from the ancient Roman names of components of such a tool. Clevis is the tool itself. Tang is uh, this thing in the middle, and peel is a pin is a kind of uh, nail which connects these two things. That's where these strange names come from. Thanks for your attention. Thank you for your presentation. Do we any questions? I have the following question. Can we use the Shamir scheme for Tang? Can we make several service key ones, main ones? So if a server is stolen and you have to decrypt disks so that in some remote location we have a Tang server, we can connect to and decrypt, or we can make a scheme with two servers again to protect ourselves from such a situation. Have you thought about this? So on the client side, several servers uh, were mentioned using the Shamir scheme. We can have several servers, several pins, which require trust code. So the availability of any server is sufficient. From the it's on the client side. On the server side, FTP server. If one of the balance is taken, you will have the other one. So. client should know the public keys of this service to trust them. Any more questions? Do we have more questions? Thank you for your presentation. It was amazing. Actually, I had a desire to go to Fedorkin and to build it. I have an amateur question. So how disk encryption influences the disk performance and CPU utilization? Well, it depends on the algorithm of encryption you use as of today. AES 256 is used mostly. Here we encrypt only the data block which describes how to get to the secret key, which is stored in looks covered with this thing. And looks encrypts the disk. Yes, 256 or 512. As usual on Intel processors, this process instruction, you have it, and the there is no any more ghost on the processor side. The laptops are delivered with this instruction. How? Well, regardless of the clavis 
everything will work in the same way. This is the moment of key discovery. So the thing doesn't work in the process of encrypting. You can switch off tank server and clevis. So during the process of work, as soon as you have found your key, it doesn't matter anymore. The cryptographic operations in the disk system, well, there is a shot and fall down, but I think it's no more than 1%, otherwise it would not be used so widely. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question about authorization in the network in order to get connected to any of these services. So I'm traveling to different countries. I see Wi-Fi only. I don't see any copper systems. So do you need any authorization in the network or just copper cables? Well, this communication mechanism with tank survey implies some physical connection to the network. So in case we travel to somewhere, we have the Shamir scheme. It allows us to connect several mechanisms and all the time the initial password the manual input of this password is one of the options. S4. The other aspect, it's a, it's a separate story. So my another presentation was about this, so I will deliver it next year. It's my teaser for the next year. I have a meta question. What if uh, the tank server is taken from you? So can this person who has taken the server encrypt any disk? Well, in the laboratory, he will be able to restore the structure only if your connection was only made to this tank server. I showed you the scheme. For example, if my laptop is taken from me, well, it's clear that people will try to unlock it. It's not a technical problem, it's an organizational problem. If You are deprived both of equipment and people, and uh, they cut your fingers. Well, this problem cannot be solved technically. We try to solve technical problems as soon as they arrive. Actually, I like complicated problems, only if they are of technical nature. Well, when your fingers are cut, if your laptop is stolen, I think this is another problem which should be solved at uh, the legislative level. What about UBK? Can it be a second factor when loading the server? Can we load tank server with authorization? Well, I mean UBK. This is client, and uh, this client unlocks the loading disk of itself. If uh, the server tank is such a client, well, why not? Technically, it is possible. When I was preparing for this presentation, I took the utility of MKSA which Leonard yesterday described in his presentation, and I added the integration with Clavis. It's not loaded correctly yet, but I can show you. So it's not loaded yet because we don't have a server, it's disconnected. Well, if I take up the server, I'll show you. Uh, 
I will generate again the disk image. It's not a workstation, it was launched on its MCOS server with Clavis integration. So it refers to this Clavis server and asks me whether I trust this key. Not the Clavis server, but Tank server D client. So technically, we can do as follows. The Tank server will have a root pod, and there we will have pins which will look at the key and HSM, where Tank server will keep something, store something, and somewhere it will request its availability. So without this key, well, if Tank server is taken from you, the thieves will not be able to to launch anything. So by thieves, well, I mean some abstract people, some authorities. So, well, you can integrate it like that. This is a question of some policy implementation. In this case, Clavis is set up differently. It is not using this tank server. In this case, I will have the following. Let me press Control S and attention, we have draw card, they generate a Clavis module is connected, so this module replaces the password request. So this helper is replaced with Clavis. Clavis will look and launch pins in parallel. So one pin is the password input. Another pin in our case is tank server. Yes, nearly. It's a very good network, but that's not from the network. These are local hashed packets. However, now there'll be an image that I'll be able to launch, but I won't be able to switch it to my tank server so far now. Well, and uh, in this place, uh, it's assumed that I need to get uh, the password from the tank server, but unfortunately, no query for it is coming, so it's only done manually. Now let me show you. Yeah. Even inside the system, we won't be able to uh, see because we don't have this uh, device because uh, I've launched it within this non-container manager, uh, so uh, it, it didn't uh, install any disks inside. Anyway, this image is uh, launched and even decrypts something, as uh, you can see, but not uh, by me. That's it. Thank you. Thanks again for the presentation. Thus, we have oh, the last question, perhaps. Yeah, I have a question. Thanks for the presentation. You've said that one may install the thresholds on what's the minimum necessary to get a response from servers, etc., from Benza. But each reply returns us the same phrase or uh, from each piece we comprise the whole password because we may exclude one. Say we have two and when if we say that one of the two is sufficient, how does it work? That's the way it works. It's Shamira scheme or method. We need several pieces. We say how many pieces are necessary at each stage. If we get back to these slides, pay attention. 
At each stage, there is a different threshold. On stage two, we should have the TPM. As a minimum, we should have the access to the hardware key, to the IP of uh, the hardware key, and um, any of the passwords. But to decipher, decrypt over uh, the secret in each of these uh, separate branches, it's enough to have a separate branch. So we use the Shamira method uh, for collection of logic conditions, uh, finally. They're not interconnected directly. What we get uh, using this scheme is um, just a return condition saying the two branches necessary from N have been done. The result of uh, is not important for us. Why that? Because we are using the local key that we locally generated and we restore it at each separate stage right here. That's it. So we can use such elements that may not support our scheme at all. The scheme of work with the public key with the secret key and the ephemeric key is only used for, at, for Tango. All the other models are using different approaches. So this is uh, the configuration at the client. Yes, sir. Uh, and is it in the encrypted or non-encrypted part of the disk, area of the disk? Uh, this is inside the locks container. It's readable if the container is open. So we could correct it from two to one. Yeah, to correct it, you need to rewrite it. And to rewrite it, you need to have the decrypted um, password. Aha, uh -huh, I see. It's only readable. Again, thanks a lot to the speaker.